I think we can get started. My name is Lori Hazeltine. I'm going to be moderating this uh, virtual tour today. Uh, Steve Masters will be presenting the tour. Lou Milton uh, has been helping with the camera work as well as Maureen Hicks. And we have Alex Perloff, uh, who is a postdoc student working on the CMS experiment who will be here to answer questions. So with that, let's begin. Hi, welcome to Fermilab, America's particle physics laboratory. I'm Steve and I'll be taking you around today. Right now we're standing in front of Wilson Hall, the main building on our campus. Wilson Hall is 16 stories high. It houses the offices of many of our scientists, as well as all the support services here at Fermilab. And in the area surrounding Wilson Hall, we have a couple of ponds. We have Swan Lake, which actually is pretty good to fish in and supports quite a bit of wildlife. And then you can also see, probably here, that we have some new construction going on here. And we'll talk about that when we get a look at it from upstairs. But right now, let's go on in, have a look around. So what do we do here? Well, we study fundamental particles. By fundamental particles, I mean the smallest particles that we know of. In other words, when I was in school, we learned that the building blocks of matter was molecules. And if you broke molecules down into their components, you got atoms. And if you broke atoms down into their components, you got protons, neutrons, and electrons. And that was where we stopped. But now we know that while electrons are a fundamental particle, in other words, there's no smaller component to an electron as far as we know, protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. Protons and neutrons are made of smaller particles called quarks. And then there's a whole bunch of other particles which exist in nature, but aren't necessarily part of the atom. And those are the kinds of things that we study here. And our tool for conducting that study is the accelerator. This is Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. And we have an accelerator that produces the most intense particle beam in the world. It also produces the second highest energy particle beam in the world. And what we do in a nutshell is we accelerate a beam of protons almost to the speed of light, like 99.999949s percent of the speed of light, and then we crash it into something. For about 28 years, when we had the highest energy particle beam in the world, we actually had a beam of protons that we accelerated around the ring one way, a beam of antiprotons that we accelerated around the ring the other way, and at two points on that ring, we collided those beams into each other and examined the spray of particles that came out. Now what we do is we use our proton beam to crash into some fixed targets, some stationary targets, and by doing that, we can create beams of two other types of particles, namely muons and neutrinos. And now we are focused on the study of those two particles, muons and neutrinos. So I want you to know that our accelerator is huge, but it's not that mysterious. I would be willing to bet that every one of you has spent a good part of your life looking at a particle accelerator. You know what it is? It's your TV set. Not the newer TV sets, not the flat screen ones, but the older ones, the tube type that are this big from back to front and they weigh a ton. Those are electron accelerators. 
They're accelerating a beam of electrons into a phosphorescent screen. The beam is doing this really fast across the screen. When it hits the screen, it creates a dot. And then the sum of all those dots gives you the picture. So you're all familiar with particle accelerators. And we'll talk about other uses for particle accelerators as we go around on the tour. Um, what we're gonna do today is this. Uh, we're gonna stay down here for maybe another minute and I'll tell you a little bit about the history and a little bit about this building. Then we're gonna go up to the 15th floor and get a bird's eye view of the whole site looking out three different directions and talk about what we see out the windows and talk about the experiments that we're doing and where Fermilab is headed. Then we're gonna go into the linear accelerator, which is where our particle beam starts and talk about how the accelerators work. And then we will have some time where I'll be joined by one of our scientists and we will answer your questions. So one thing I might mention while I think of it is at any time during the tour, if you have a question, type it into the chat and then we will get to them at the end of the tour. So a little bit about this building. Uh, it's called Wilson Hall. It's named after Robert Wilson. Robert Wilson was the first director of Fermilab. He was appointed by Congress to both build and then serve as our first director. And that was back in 1967 is when Fermilab actually started. And Wilson was a lot of things. He was an interesting guy. He was first and foremost a physicist. He was a civil rights activist. He was an artist. He was a sculptor. And actually over the course of the tour, we'll see two of his sculptures and I'll point them out to you. He, he was a pacifist for much of his life, but he served on the Manhattan Project. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Manhattan Project was the group of scientists that developed the first atomic bomb. So what was a pacifist doing developing an atomic bomb? Well, he felt that in light of the events that were going on in the world at that time, World War II had started, our enemies were working hard to develop an atomic bomb as well, he felt it was the lesser of two evils to take part in that. But when he started Fermilab, he was really adamant that this was going to be a peaceful place, that we would not be doing any top secret high tech research um, defense, for defense, that um, even though we were a US institution, we would also be a collaboration of scientists from all over the world working together for the common goal of learning about uh, fundamental particles. And in fact, you can see we have flags here. Uh, the flags represent some of the 43 countries where either scientists from those countries are working here at Fermilab in our experiments, or Fermilab scientists are working on experiments that are taking place in other countries. Since we don't have enough places to get all the flags in, we rotate them. Um, another thing about Wilson was that it was important to him that he wanted the place to be beautiful. And both culturally and aesthetically, he wanted the place to have a lot to offer. Um, when this was built, this was just out in the sticks. Nobody really thought that the Chicago metropolitan area would creep out here. And he needed to attract and keep some of the top scientists in the world. Uh, people like Leon Leverman came here who, who had won a Nobel Prize. Well, uh, for that reason, he thought it was important to, to, to create a place that was attractive to those kinds of people and would want to keep them. And he took some criticism because every dollar he spent making the place nice was a dollar taken away from science, at least that's what people told him. But he was looking at the bigger long-term picture of getting the right kind of people here. So why don't we head on over to the elevators and head on up to the 15th floor. You can see the director's office over here. Nigel Lockyer is our director. A couple other interesting facts. So the building is 16 stories high. We're, we're going up to the 15th floor. Wilson used a helicopter to determine the height of the building and to determine the site of the building. 
And one other thing I think is interesting is that he was so serious about using science as a tool to bring people from many nations together for the purpose of peace, that even in the early 70s, there were Soviet scientists here in collaboration with our experiments. And that was the height of the Cold War. Um, so that's a pretty remarkable thing as far as I'm concerned. So now we are on the 15th floor. And we are going to head over here to this big table that you see. <clears throat> this table is a site map of the property. Um, the Fermilab campus is about 6,800 acres. That's a little bit over 10 and a half square miles. Um, over on the east side of the property, there's actually a small town, which we call the village. There's um, some labs over there. There's housing there, which houses um, visiting scientists and also our summer intern program. But we are right here now in Wilson Hall. And our particle beam starts right next to Wilson Hall in a building called the Linear Accelerator. And we're gonna be going there in about 20, 25 minutes. So the beam starts at the Linear Accelerator and travels 500 feet down it. All the while, we're kicking it and kicking it and kicking it and adding more energy to it, accelerating it. From the Linear Accelerator, it goes to this small ring here called the Booster Ring. And we'll also see that when we get over to one of the other windows. And then from there, it goes to this large two-mile circumference ring called the main injector ring. And again, we're accelerating it more and more as it goes through the main injector ring. After the main injector ring, it goes to our two main experimental areas. So the area where we're studying muons is this area here. And the area where we're studying neutrinos is this area here. And then the beam continues on, the neutrino beam continues on 500 miles to northern Minnesota. And we'll talk in a little more detail about those experiments in a little while. So that is the current state of the beam here at Fermilab. But what is this big, huge ring here? Well, this is a four mile circumference ring called the main ring or the Tevatron. And this is the ring that for 28 years was the highest energy accelerator in the world. It produced the highest energy uh, proton beam in the world. And this is the one I mentioned where we had a beam of protons going around it one way. We had a beam of antiprotons going around it the other way. There were two points here and here where we collided those beams into each other in the middle of huge detectors, examined the spray of particles that came out as a result of that collision. And actually, the top quark, one of the fundamental particles, was discovered in those experiments in 1995. Now, prior to 1983, the beam went around this main ring just in one direction and then went down three different beam lines this way. And there were fixed targets or stationary targets out there that we collided the beam into. And so the experiments took place out there. The bottom quark, another one of the fundamental particles, was discovered in one of these experiments in 1977. So let's go over to the window facing north and start looking at some of this stuff. So the first thing I want to point out of this window is the garden down there. That garden shows us what Fermilab's logo is. And that's pretty important because uh, the logo represents the two main types of magnets that we use here at Fermilab. Accelerators are critical to the operation of, or magnets are, excuse me, magnets are critical to the operation of the accelerator. And um, there are two main types of magnets that we use here at Fermilab. So you can see the, the, the logo has two parallel lines and, two cur and four curved lines. The two parallel lines represent what we call a dipole magnet. That's a common magnet, the type you're used to. It has a north pole and a south pole. And we use the dipole magnets for steering the beam. The beam would want to go straight. We've got it going in a circle. So we use those dipole magnets for steering the beam. And then the four curved lines 
represent what we call a quadrupole magnet. That's a little bit more complicated magnet. It has four poles, two north poles and two south poles. And the quadrupole magnets are used for focusing the beam. The beam would want to spread out just like a flashlight beam does, and we have to keep it sharp. So we use those quadrupole magnets for focusing. Looking a little bit further out down the pond, you can see an obelisk, and that obelisk is one of Robert Wilson's sculptures. That was his retirement gift to the lab. And then looking further out, you can see headed off to that building towards the left with the curved roof, and then headed straight out, you can see two long skinny grass berms. And there's actually a third one going off to the right, but that one's difficult to see. But in tunnels under those berms are the three original beam lines that I mentioned, um, where the beam traveled in those tunnels out there, was collided into fixed targets, and the experiments took place out there. The beam line going off to the left, to that building with the curved roof, is actually still active. That building is called our testing facility. Um, there's two things that go on there. One, uh, we're one of the few places in the world that has a beam like this. And so, and there's lots of scientists all over the world that would love to do research using a beam like we have. So they can actually apply to use our beam and, and book time in that building using our beam for their own research. <clears throat> also, we can use the beam out there for testing new detector technology or anything that we might need to test that we, we might want to put in front of a beam. Another thing you can see out there, which is interesting, is our power poles. So we get our, our power from Commonwealth Edison, just like most of Northern Illinois. We're by far their biggest user. But you can see our power poles are kind of an interesting shape. They're not your standard old power poles. And they are shaped like the Greek letter pi. And why we have pi power poles? Well, Robert Wilson was an artist, and Robert Wilson was kind of a science geek, and he wanted pi power poles. And the story is, is that he had a big fight with Commonwealth Edison because they didn't want us to have pi power poles, but he won. And his hope was that they would see that those were elegant and were inspired thought about science and math, and hopefully that they would decide to use pi power poles as their standard, but that never happened. Swinging around to the right, there's a white semicircular building, and that is called the Feynman Computing Center. And that is one of two data storage facilities here at Fermilab. So in our experiments, we generate a lot of data. I mean, a lot of data, and we have to store it. And so um, there is data in there going back to the 70s. Some of it's on tape in these super clean rooms that need robotics to go in and get it out. And we can store about 600 petabytes of data. If you don't know what a petabyte is after the tour, Google it. It's a lot of data, believe me. To the right of the Feynman Computing Center, there's a whole complex of buildings, and that's called our industrial complex. Out of necessity, because magnets are so important to us here, out of necessity, we have become the premier magnet research and development facility in the world. And that is where all of that takes place. Also, in, that, in those buildings, we have our quantum computing lab, where we are on the frontier of science, um, trying to uh, take part in the development of quantum computers. Behind the industrial complex, you see a big open area and a red barn in the distance. And in that area is where we keep our bison herd. So um, we have had a bison herd since 1969. Uh, last I heard was this season, we've had 19 calves so far. Uh, why do we have a bison herd? Well, Robert Wilson wanted some kind of a symbol for the lab. Bison represent the frontier of America. They were once native to this area. And he felt that was a good way of saying that Fermilab was on the frontier of science. Also, two other reasons. Um, in 1969, bison were seriously endangered. And we became part of a national effort to restore the bison population to health. And also, it's a nod to the indigenous people that once lived in this area. 
The building that you see to the right of the industrial complex, it's white and has a little bit of orange on it and it's kind of an interesting shape. That is called IARC, Illinois Accelerator Research Center. And that is a place where we work together with Illinois Industries to bring our technology, the accelerator technology that's developed here to them. The building's pretty interesting because it's what we call LEED certified. It's like made of all recyclable materials and it's super energy efficient and super green. Um, the heating and air conditioning system is basically these pipes which go hundreds of feet in, under the ground and, and bring the air up that way to keep the place warm and cool. You can see the edge of the Tevatron ring here, but we're gonna go over to another window in a minute and get a better look at it. The last thing I wanna point out is that construction that we heard and saw at the beginning of the tour, that is called the IERC building, I-E-R-C, Integrated Engineering Research Center. And it will be a building which will bring all of the engineers from all different disciplines under one roof so that they can collaborate with each other and work together better. So let's head over now and look at the window facing east. So now we're looking east and you can see the Tevatron ring, the four mile ring where we had protons going around one way, um, anti-protons going around the other way, collided them into each other, discovered the top quark. Um, the Tevatron ring is actually, if you look down, you can see some pipes on top of a grass berm and then you can follow the berm around. The two points where we collided the beams one is the blue building straight across. And the other one, the building is gone, but it's in front of the orange part of the IARC building. So at those points, about 40 feet underground, we collided the beams into each other, discovered the top quark. The Tevatron is actually in a tunnel about 40 feet underground under those berms. So that's one interesting thing out the window. Another interesting thing out the window is the center of the ring. So the center of the ring is the first large scale prairie restoration in the US. So prairie is an ecosystem that used to cover most of Illinois, or actually most of the Midwest, all the way from the Rocky Mountains to the Appalachians. And it's an ecosystem which is pretty much obliterated. In fact, in all of Illinois, there's only about 2,000 acres of undisturbed prairie left. And it's not all in one place, it's just little bits here and there. So there was a professor at Northeastern Illinois University, a biology professor named Dr. Betts. He was studying prairie. He had been restoring it on a small scale here and there, wherever he could find a place to do it. He was looking for a place to do it on a large scale. He heard that Dr. Wilson was starting Fermilab, had all this available land and wanted to do something positive with the land. And so he approached him and proposed using some of the land to restore prairie on a large scale. Uh, and the story goes that Wilson asked him, well, you know, how long will it take to restore prairie on a large scale here? And that said, I don't really know. I've never done it like that before. It might take 15 or 20 years. Wilson's response was just, well, you get, better get started this afternoon. So this is a couple hundred acres. Now we have a little bit over a thousand acres of prairie here at Fermilab, and it's really a beautiful ecosystem. Um, there's all kinds of endangered plants, endangered pollinators. We have trails through some sections of our prairie, and I would encourage you, after COVID, come here and hike the trails and explore the prairie. One other interesting thing out the window 
is the new construction going on here. <clears throat> that is called the PIP2 building. So we're going to go in the linear accelerator in a few minutes, and you are going to see that it's kind of old. It, it's awesome. It gives us the most intense particle beam in the world, but it's pushing 50 years old. And also, we want an even more intense particle beam than we have. So this building is going to house what's called the PIP2 accelerator, which will replace the linear, linear accelerator, give us a considerably more intense particle beam and lead us into the future where we can continue to be the premier accelerator-based neutrino research facility in the world. And we'll talk a little bit about more about neutrinos and the experiments in a minute. But before we do that, I want to turn around and talk about this exhibit behind us. So this is a mock-up of the inside of the Tevatron tunnel. You can see it has the curved ceiling like the inside of the tunnel. The mirrors are cocked a little bit, so it gives the illusion of the curvature of the ring. If you went inside the Tevatron tunnel, it would look a lot like this, except this is better lit and there's no snakes up here. Other than that, it looks a lot like the Tevatron tunnel. And this up here is the first accelerator that was built at Fermilab in the early 70s. This is not the Tevatron, this was called the main main ring accelerator. And these are the magnets that I talked about that are used for steering and focusing the beam. So this one here is a dipole magnet. This is used for steering the beam. And then this one over here, uh, and there would be one of these every fifth magnet, this one is the quadrupole magnet used for focusing the beam. The beam went through this pipe right here. This is a stainless steel pipe. There's a really high vacuum in there, higher than the vacuum in outer space, because we don't want our beam bumping into any air molecules. <clears throat> These are small magnets used for fine tuning and correction of the position of the beam. This is showing that all over the place, this is just an example, all over the place there were sensors um, monitoring the temperature, the vacuum, the performance of the magnets, the quality of the beam. The, um, everything that we needed to monitor to keep the beam running smoothly. These are water pipes. Most of the water that you saw on site was used for cooling the magnets, and these are the pipes that brought that water. So this is the first accelerator, like I said, that was built here at Fermilab. But they left room underneath for this, and this is another accelerator. This is the one that I've been referring to as the Tevatron. It gets the name Tevatron because Terra is the prefix for a trillion, and EV stands for electron volts, which is how we measure the energy level of the accelerator. So the goal was, and the goal was exceeded, to get this accelerator past a trillion electron volts. So we gave it the nickname the Tevatron. And you can see that these magnets are quite a bit smaller than these magnets, but they're way more powerful. And the reason is, is because of a magnet technology that was developed here at Fermilab called superconducting magnets. So to explain what superconducting magnets are, I first have to explain what the concept of resistance is. You may already know, but resistance, wires have a property called resistance. Current does not flow through the wire with perfect efficiency. The atoms in the wire are wiggling around and banging into each other, and that prevents the perfect flow of current through the wire. Picture your toaster. Those are high resistance wires. Um, you run current through them. Instead of the current flowing through efficiently, the wires heat up, they glow, they toast your bread. That's good. That's good for toasters. But it's not good for accelerators because that's energy that we want to use to create a strong magnetic field, and instead it's going to generate heat. And also, we have to carry that heat away. Look how big these magnets are. You can imagine it wouldn't take long before they start melting things and catching on fire and bad stuff happens. So what superconductivity is, is the idea that if you get some materials cold enough, and I mean really cold, like we use liquid helium, which is about four degrees above absolute zero, about 450 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, maybe 269 degrees below zero centigrade. If you get something that cold, now the atoms in the wire are stationary. They're no longer banging into each other. And that allows for the perfect flow of current with no losses 
through that wire and also no heat generation through that wire. So therefore you can get way more current through the same size wire and therefore a way more powerful magnet in the same or even a smaller package size. One of the interesting things about the superconducting magnet is that it was developed here so that we could have the Tevatron, but the medical industry was interested in that technology and they took that technology and used it to develop the MRI machine. And so that's just one of the benefits of society that have come out of here at Fermilab. We're going to walk around the corner here and talk about a couple more. So here we've got a picture of a cargo ship with cargo containers on it at a port, <clears throat> and that's because accelerators are used to look inside cargo containers for port security to be sure that they are not carrying illegal radioactive materials into the country. Over here, we have a tire because accelerators are used in the rubber vulcanization process in the production of tires. Natural rubber is sticky. Vulcanization is the process that makes it um, hard and useful, and we use accelerators for that. There are tons of medical applications that, that our technology is used in. Um, just one I want to bring up, this would be from our detector technology, is positron emission tomography, or the PET scan. You may have heard of it. That's a cancer diagnostic tool. What I think is one of the most interesting things uh, that came out of particle physics, and it was not developed here, it was developed at our sister lab in Switzerland called CERN, but that's the World Wide Web. So the World Wide Web was developed by physicists who wanted to share large amounts of data with each other, collaborate with each other, and interestingly enough, the very, two, the very first two websites ever on the World Wide Web was our sister lab CERN and then Fermilab was the second website ever on the World Wide Web. In fact, about the first 12 websites on the World Wide Web were all um, physics scientific institutions that used it for that purpose. And then after that was when we got cats playing the piano. So we're gonna go over here to the south window <coughs> and have a look out there. So the first thing I want to show you is straight down, and that is one of Wilson's sculptures, another one. That's actually a Mobius strip. There's also a Mobius strip on my shirt, if you, if you saw it. It's a sketch of that sculpture. But um, what a Mobius strip is is basically just an interesting shape that has a mathematical formula uh, to explain it. And if you're kind of a science geek or math geek, you would think it's cool. So. The linear accelerator, where we're going to go in a few minutes, is that long, skinny, white building that you see off to the right, and also the grass berm next to it is part of that structure. And so our particle beam starts at the front of the linear accelerator, travels 500 feet down. All the while, we're kicking it and kicking it and kicking it. Then it goes into that concrete ring that you see in front of us called the booster ring. Remember the point where the linear accelerator meets up with the booster ring because when we get down there, I'll point it out to you and that'll give you some reference. So the beam travels around the booster ring and then it goes out to that large racetrack shaped ring that you see in the distance called the main injector ring. That's a two mile circumference ring. And then from there, it goes to our two main experimental areas. So the muon study area are these two white buildings that you see over here. Muons are a pretty interesting particle. They're a cousin of the electron. They're negatively charged like an electron. They're about 200 times more massive than an electron. And they're not very stable, whereas electrons live basically forever. Um, a, a muon lives about 26 millionths of a second, which isn't very long, and then it decays. Usually it decays to an electron, plus a couple neutrinos, plus some energy. 
But muons are very common in nature. In fact, cosmic radiation hits the outer atmosphere. The collision with the outer atmosphere produces muons, and we're being showered with muons all the time that are coming from outer space. Uh, in fact, I'd estimate every second, um, maybe five to 10 muons are hitting your body. So there are two main experiments that are going on with muons. The first one is in the white building on the right, and it's an experiment called mu to e We are currently, it's currently under construction. So I mentioned that muons typically decay to an electron plus a couple neutrinos plus some energy. Well, we feel that that's the most common decay path of the muon, but not the only decay path of the muon. Um, so we are building, in the process of building an experiment in that building, which will be able to observe other decay paths of the muon, namely a muon decaying directly to an electron, no neutrinos. The other experiment that we're doing with muons is taking place now in that uh, white building to the left that has a little bit of orange on it, and in there we're running an experiment called G minus two. So one of the interesting things about many particles is that they spin. And also some particles, including the muon, if you put them in a magnetic field, that spin will do what we call precess, or in a sense wobble. The best way to describe precess is if you imagine spinning a top, and then when the top starts to slow down, it starts to do this kind of thing. So that's precess. And muons will do that in a magnetic field. Well, we have calculated what the magnetic moment of that wobble or that precess should be. And about 10 years ago, there was an experiment done at Brookhaven National Lab, which measured what that magnetic moment of that wobble should be. And it ended up different than the calculated value. Well, why would it be different? Well, it could be that there was some type of error in their measurement. Or it could be that there's something else going on perhaps some unknown particle interacting with the muon, and we're not taking that into account in the calculation because we don't know about it, and that could be the reason why the calculated value ended up different than the measured value. So in the building over here, we are in a sense repeating that experiment, but we're taking it a few steps further. One, we have um, improved our measurement technique and improved the equipment that we're using, and at the Brookhaven experiment, they measured that magnetic moment of that wobble to eight decimal points. We are measuring it to 12 decimal points. And there were some preliminary results that came out in May uh, from our experiment, which showed that yes, indeed, the calculated value still is coming up different than the measured value. So we, haven't, we don't have enough statistically to say we have a, a, a discovery yet, but we're going to continue to analyze the data that we've taken and continue to take more data for the next couple of years. And hopefully we will get to the point where we can say, yes, that measurement is actually different than the calculated value. And there's something else going on here that we need to investigate further. So the other particle that we study here, and I saved the best for last because I think they're the coolest, is the neutrino. So neutrinos are everywhere. They are, they are the most abundant particle in the universe that has mass that we know of. Um, they're produced by the sun, they're produced by supernova, they're produced by other stars, they're produced by radioactive decay. Uh, it's estimated that if I hold up my thumb, there's a billion neutrinos every second that pass right through my thumb. And they don't do anything, they just pass through my thumb and then they pass through the floor and they pass through the earth and they come out the other side and keep on going through outer space. Neutrinos are really, really small. We don't know the mass of a neutrino yet. We do know the upper limit of the mass of a neutrino is about a thousand times less massive than an electron. And we know that neutrinos don't have any charge. So they're not influenced by electric fields. They're not influenced by magnetic fields, which is consequently why they almost never interact with anything. So there's two main experiments that we're doing with neutrinos. One is this. So we actually know that there's three kinds of neutrinos. There is an electron neutrino, 
which corresponds to the electron, which we know about. There's a muon neutrino, which corresponds to the muon, the particle we just talked about, its heavier, less stable cousin. And then there's a tau neutrino, which corresponds to the tau, an even heavier, even less stable particle in that same family. So um, one of the experiments that we're doing is this. So we know there's these three types of neutrinos, electron, muon, tau. But there's been a couple of experiments, one at Los Alamos National Laboratory and one here, which have indicated that there's a chance that there may be a fourth type of neutrino or even a fourth family of neutrinos. We call it the sterile neutrino because if it exists, it's even less interactive than the other three types of neutrinos. So one of the things that we're doing is we have some detectors over here where we are um, trying to determine yay or nay, does the sterile neutrino indeed exist or not? So that's one of the experiments we're doing with neutrinos. The other, and again, I saved the coolest for last, so there's three types of neutrinos, electron, muon, tau. One of the neat things and unique things about neutrinos is that as a neutrino travels through space, it can do what we call oscillate, or it can change its identity. So in other words, you can have an electron neutrino, it's traveling through space, it becomes a muon neutrino, travels through space, becomes a tau neutrino. So we have an experiment where we're trying to study that oscillation. And what we do is this. So we create a beam which is almost exclusively muon neutrinos. And then we have some detectors over here where we um, look at the, the beam very close to its source and can look at the composition of that beam. And then basically, um, the Earth curves like this. The Earth curves like this. We get the right angle into the Earth. It's about three and a half degrees. The beam travels 500 miles underground through the Earth. It comes out in northern Minnesota, pretty close to the Canada border near International Falls. And we have a huge detector there where we also analyze the composition of that beam. So therefore, we have some space between here and there so that we can study this oscillation or this change of identity of neutrinos as they go, as they travel through space. So that experiment is called NOVA. The next experiment to come up is going to be called DUNE, Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. We're going to, we are in the process now of building a detector uh, a mile underground in an existing mine, 800 miles away, and we will use the DUNE experiment to continue um, studying this oscillation. So you might wonder, how does a neutrino travel right through the Earth? Well, you kind of have to understand the structure of the atom a little bit. So probably a lot of you have seen a picture like this. If you took a chemistry class or whatever, this is a model of the atom, and it shows that the atom is a central nucleus made of protons and neutrons, and then there's a cloud of electrons flying around it. And to give you that concept, this drawing is pretty good. But to give you an idea of what the relative sizes and spacing are of those things, the drawing is kind of misleading. So what I want you to do is imagine a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is the simplest atom. It's one proton and one electron. So picture your hydrogen atom, and I want you to blow it up to the size of a football stadium. OK? So now your proton is going to be like a P down in the middle of the field somewhere. And the electron is going to be like a piece of dust flying around the football stadium. I don't know if my example is dimensionally accurate, but it's way closer to accurate than that drawing that I just showed you. And what does that say about the nature of matter, the nature of the atom? Well, it says that stuff is mostly space. You think, think of the hardest things you can think of, like diamonds or, or the densest thing you can think of, like lead. And you think they're that way because they're these teeny tiny particles that are crammed close together, but they're not. Those things are hard and dense because they're teeny tiny particles way far apart relative to their size that are held together by enormous forces. So now you got this neutrino. It's a thousand times less massive than that piece of dust flying around the football field. And so therefore, it's really easy to see how they can just fly right through matter 
and aren't, you know, they don't have a charge, so they don't care that the electron is negatively charged or the proton is positively charged. So you can see easily how they can just fly right through as if there's nothing there. And the real question to me is not how do they travel through the Earth, but the question becomes how do you detect them? Don't they just travel right through the detector like there's nothing there? And the answer to that question pretty much is yeah. So we are every 1.3 seconds, we send a shot of 10 to the 15th neutrinos into our detectors. So that's, that's one with 15 zeros after it, or a quadrillion neutrinos. I can't even imagine how many that is. And so every 1.3 seconds, we're sending a quadrillion neutrinos into the detectors. At our near detectors here, we get about 100 to 150 neutrino events a day. And at our far detector in Minnesota, we get about 10 to 15 neutrino events a week. The only way that we can detect a neutrino is this. So imagine again that P in the middle of the football stadium. If you shoot enough neutrinos at that P, there's a, or into that stadium, there's a probability, it's small, but there is a probability that some of them will get close enough to that P that they'll interact with it. And when that happens, that produces charged particles, that produces photons of light, that produces things that we can see in our detector and can track in our detector, and we can work backwards and figure out what happened in that collision. So the way to do good neutrino science then is to get the biggest, densest detector that you can. The detector that we're building for Dune is going to be four compartments that are about 50 feet by 50 feet by 200 feet, they're filled with 70,000 tons of liquid argon. And so you get the biggest, densest detector that you can, and you get the most intense beam that you can, which is why we're building this new PIP2 accelerator here, which will give us an even more intense beam than we already have. And when you have those things, you can increase the probability that you get neutrino interactions. You can collect data at a faster rate and do a better job studying the things that you want to study about neutrinos. So I want to shift gears. Oh, so this is a, just a little diagram showing that the beam is going to start here at Fermilab. It's actually going to go 800 miles underground and come out near Leeds, South Dakota, at what's, the, what's called the Sanford Underground Research Facility. It's actually a, a former gold mine, which is now used as a research facility, and the detectors will be a mile underground. So now I want to shift gears and talk about another interesting thing, or thing I find interesting about Fermilab, and that's that up till now, we've talked about all these, you know, how we study the teeniest, tiniest particles that we know of. But on the flip side, Fermilab is also involved with studying the, the cosmos, the entire universe as a whole. And the reason is, is because you tend to think of, of astronomy and astrophysics as getting telescopes and looking at stuff and learning about those things from the visible light that you see coming to us from those things. And that's certainly an important part of it. But there's so much more information coming to us from outer space than just visible light. Um, first of all, there's every other wavelength of, of electromagnetic ra radiation you can imagine. There's microwaves, and there's x-rays, and there's ultraviolet radiation, and gamma rays. And then the other thing is that Outer space is full of particles. We talked about neutrinos already that are everywhere outer space. Outer space is full of protons. There's muons. Outer space is full of particles. So our detector technology lends itself really well to studying all this other information that's coming to us from outer space. A couple quick examples of some of the things we're involved in. So we built a lens and a camera, which is on a telescope in Chile and it's part of what we call the Dark Energy Survey. And in fact, the Dark Energy Survey just recently, I think it was the beginning of June, released the most detailed sky map ever of the southern skies. This is a, a picture of, um, that was done by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. That was a sky survey that, that preceded the Dark Energy Survey. The Dark Energy Survey's map is even more detailed than that. 
Um, another thing we're involved in because of our detector technology is trying to understand dark matter. What's dark matter? Well, we don't know. What we do know is that dark matter seems to make up about 25% of the mass of the universe. It's some particle or particles which we see the gravitational effects of, but by the way galaxies move, but other than that, we really know very little about it, what it is, what its structure is, or anything. So our detector technology is on assorted experiments all over the world trying to detect and understand what dark matter is. One other quick one is on the South Pole, we have a telescope, um, and it, it's called the South Pole Telescope, and it is doing what's called um, a survey of the cosmic microwave background, it is mapping the cosmic microwave background, which we believe to be the first light that was released after the Big Bang. So we are gonna head back now to the linear accelerator and talk about how accelerators work. And I just wanna point out again now, since I've talked about it, uh, the PIP2 accelerator. So this is the accelerator that is gonna give us an incredibly intense neutrino beam and lead us into the future where we'll, we'll continue to be the premier accelerator-based neutrino research facility in the world. On our left is a mock-up of the Dark Energy Survey Telescope, the one that's in Chile that we built the lens and camera for. We have the fastest beam in the world and the slowest elevators in the world. So now we're headed down to the ground floor and we will walk across the street to see the linear accelerator. jet cutting equipment, NC machines, things like that. But the point is, is that you probably can see already that everything we do here is big, and everything we do here has probably never been done before, so the apparatus that we need to conduct our experiments doesn't exist. So we have to design it, we have to build it, and also, you know, we have physicists that have these amazing ideas and, um, and design amazing experiments, but there has to be somebody or some people back here on planet Earth that can uh, build it, fix it, keep it running. So here at Fermilab, we have um, people from not just machinists, but from every trade imaginable, and they are equally important to the success of our experiments as any scientist. Over here on the left is uh, more offices, office of communication is here. that we're headed towards now 
is the linear accelerator, or the linear accelerator is housed in that building. So this is where our particle beam starts. And you can see there's, there's actually two pieces of equipment in here. Um, there's this big uh, stainless steel two-piece thing that I think looks really cool. I always thought the whole thing looks like it's from the set of a Frankenstein movie. And that is called a Cockroft Wall. <clears throat> that is what we used to use to start our particle beam. It's no longer used, it's been replaced, but it's still there because it looks so cool and because we'd have to take the roof out to get it out and we're not doing that. So what we currently use to start our particle beam is this over here. That is called a radio frequency quadruple. It's the mass of pipes and copper there. And it's more efficient, it's more powerful, it gives us a more intense beam than the Cockroft Walton. And the way that it works is this. They both work on similar principles. And the way it works is this. So I want you to think for a second, we have a proton beam. What do you think would be a good source for protons? Well, how about hydrogen? Hydrogen is the simplest atom, one proton, one electron. Get rid of the electron, you got a proton, right? That's not exactly what we do, but that's the basic principle. And in fact, if you look at the bottom left corner of the radio frequency quadrupole, there's a small blue tank there, gas tank. There's actually another one on the other side that you can't see. And those are hydrogen tanks. And those two tanks provide us with about a six month supply of protons. And the way that we create our beam is this. So we actually add an start by adding an electron to the hydrogen atom. So we have a negatively charged hydrogen ion, one proton plus two electrons. And then every 1.3 seconds, the radio frequency quadrupole builds up a really strong electric charge, 750,000 electron volts. So that's like if you laid a half a million batteries end to end, you'd have a 750,000 electron volt charge. So now we got these negatively charged hydrogen ions in the presence of this really strong electric charge, which is negative. And if you remember from science, light charges repel each other. So those negatively charged hydrogen ions, they don't want to be anywhere near there. So they go shooting out of there in that direction. We'll walk around the corner in a second and see where they go. They go shooting out of there in that direction and are kicked up by the linear accelerator. And at that point where they leave the radio frequency quadrupole, they're going about 4% of the speed of light which is like about 7,000 miles a second, which is like here to Tokyo in a second. So at this point, if you look straight down, kind of behind the stairs, you can see the radio frequency quadrupole, and then the blue thing going on down the tunnel is the linear accelerator. So right in front is the point where the radio frequency quadrupole is releasing the negatively charged hydrogen ions into the accelerator. So let's go over here and talk a little bit about how it works.
come in this place, it's kind of like walking back into a science fiction movie from the 70s. This place is getting old. You can see we've got dial gauges here. Nobody uses those actual dial gauges anymore. We have an oscilloscope here. Those aren't very used much anymore. Uh, anybody know what this thing is? So the way that we speed the particles along or accelerate the particles is that we use, we create, and that's what this equipment does, creates a flip-flopping electric field. And the field is flip-flopping at radio frequencies. At this point, the accelerator is flip-flopping at 201 megahertz, or 201 million times a second that electric field is flip-flopping. So if I were to describe or sum up what all this equipment is in one sentence, I would say it's a big, old, powerful radio station. In fact, to give you an idea of how powerful it is, here in the Chicago area, we have WGN radio. WGN radio is an AM station. It broadcasts the Chicago Cubs games. You can hear the Cubs games in Michigan and Wisconsin and Indiana. WGN broadcasts at 50,000 watts. This radio station here is at 5 million watts power level. And, and you'll see as we walk down along the, the linear accelerator, you'll see that um, this stuff that we're looking at, the equipment repeats because there's five of these 5 million watt radio stations as we go down along here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it works. So this is a better shot of the linear accelerator. You saw, sort of saw this looking down the tunnel, but this makes it easier to picture what it is, what it looks like. This is what the inside of the linear accelerator looks like. It's a hollow tube. There's a vacuum in there. And spaced apart are these tubes called drift tubes. And the way it works is this. So I mentioned we have a flip-flopping electric field. Now, if you put a charged particle, remember the, the particles right now are negatively charged hydrogen ions. If you put a charged particle in an electric field, the field is going to exert a force on that particle. But the, part, the electric field is flip-flopping. So 201 million times a second, it wants to exert a force on the particle in that direction, then that direction, then that direction, then that direction. But we want to accelerate the particles only in that direction. So how do you take advantage of the times when the forces are accelerating the particle in that direction and eliminate the times when the force want, when the field wants to push the particles in that direction? Well, that's what these drift tubes are for. These drift tubes are spaced apart such that when the particle, when the force wants to push the particle in the correct direction, the particles are passing through the spaces between the tubes. So they're exposed to that force and they're accelerating. And then when the field flip-flops and wants to push the particle back, the particles are passing through these tubes. So they're shielded from the effects of that electric field and therefore they're not decelerated. They're shielded in much the same way that your cell phone doesn't work well in an elevator because you're in this metal box and electromagnetic radiation has trouble getting at you. So essentially the particles are accelerated here, left alone here, accelerated here, left alone here, or drifting here, you know, yada, 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 all the way down the whole length of the accelerator. And what you can't really tell from the angle of that picture is this. So the particle, the, the um, time interval, the 201 million times a second, the time interval that the field is flip-flopping is constant, okay? But the particles, remember, are accelerated. So in one time interval, they might travel this far. And then the next time interval, maybe they're gonna travel this far. And the next time interval, they're going even faster, so they're gonna travel this far. So what you can't really see from the angle of that picture is that the, the spacing of those tubes and the size of the tubes is very finely tuned so that it accounts for the fact that the particles are moving faster in every successive interval and traveling further in every successive interval. And the point of that is that accelerating the particles is not like flooring your car, not like stepping on the gas and flooring your car and just trying to go as fast as you can, as quick as you can. 
It's a very, very tightly controlled, finely tuned process where everywhere along our several mile long accelerator complex, we know the energy of the particle, the velocity of the particle. We know exactly what the particle is doing. So we're gonna, we're gonna stop here for a second. If you look at the equipment, I mentioned that the equipment is repeating as we go down. Now we're at radio station number four. This picture here is a picture of Robert Wilson. I talked about him, he was our first director. And this is an article that he wrote in 1946, a scientific paper where he was the first guy to propose using particle accelerators, namely protons, accelerated protons, for radiation therapy for cancer treatment. And we actually had, in this area over here, see there's a, this concrete wall we're gonna walk around, and that area there was one of the first accelerator-based radiation treatment centers in the nation. We did not have our own doctors. We contracted with outside clinics. They sent their patients here. Patients would go down in an elevator there. We had the beam, we could use magnetic field to direct the beam and position them in front of the beam and they would get zapped. Point, the beam is traveling about 75% of the speed of light, and the particles, which right now are negatively charged hydrogen ions, are they pass through a foil which strips off the electrons, and then they enter the booster ring, that concrete circular ring that I showed you from up, upstairs. So by those double doors is the point that I told you to remember for reference. That's the point where the linear accelerator enters the booster ring. A mock up of the main injector ring, that two mile racetrack shaped ring that we saw out the window. So, this is one of the magnets, this is the dipole magnet for steering. These are water pipes for bringing cooling water to the magnet. Up there, that's a permanent magnet. We call it the recycler ring. It's not, it's not accelerating anything, it's just used for storage and for um, bunching of existing particles. One of my favorite stories here at Fermilab, it's a good time to tell it because you can get a good feel for the size of the, the, um, the beam pipe. The beam pipe at different places in the lab may be different shapes, but it's all about that same size. And when Fermilab was built, there were all these sections of stainless steel pipe which were welded together to create thousands and thousands of feet of beam pipe. And it all had to be really clean inside because any weld slag in there, any debris, it could become magnetized, it could become charged, and then it would basically direct the beam, it would ruin the beam. So how do you clean thousands and thousands of feet of beam pipe? We had a big engineering problem there. Well, we solved it by getting this ferret named Felicia. And you can Google Felicia the ferret, there's stories about her, there's pictures of her, she's real cute. But essentially what we did is this. Ferrets naturally want to go through tunnels. They, that's what they naturally do is tunnel. So they trained Felicia to go through longer and longer sections of beam pipe using hamburger meat. And they put a little diaper on her. They put a little harness on her with a line tied to it, sent her through these long sections of beam pipe. And then when she came out the other end, now they had a line going all the way through so that then they could actually pull swabs and brushes and cleaning tools through to actually clean the, the pipe out. So the moral of that story is, is that you know, if you have an engineering problem, the solution is not always the highest tech, flashiest, fanciest solution. 
sometimes it's simply the most practical. As we come up to this corner, I want you to take a look at some of these pictures that we have here. These are just various pictures taken around Fermilab. I mentioned that Fermilab is 6,800 acres, but 4,000 acres of it is natural area. We're actually considered a national environmental research park. We have not only a little over 1,000 acres of prairie, but we have woodlands, we have wetlands, we have lakes. Um, Fermilab is an incredible place to come explore, um, not just for the science, but to hike through for the nature. Um, you can fish in our lakes, uh, with an Illinois license. Uh, if you're into birding, you can look on our website and we've cataloged all the species of birds that have been observed here. I think we're approaching 300. We have nesting bald eagles, nesting sandhill cranes, nesting osprey. If you're a photographer, obviously there's some pretty good opportunities for photography if you come visit Fermilab as well. The woman in the picture is one of our amazing scientists that used to be here, Helen Edwards. She is the architect of the Tevatron. So there's one other thing that I want to show you here in the linear accelerator building. This is the control room. This is where they are controlling not just the linear accelerator where we just walked through, but our entire accelerator complex. So the, the men and women that work in here have the on-off switch. Um, they are monitoring almost a quarter of a million different sensors all over our accelerator complex, looking at the position of the beam and the strength of the beam and the temperature and the vacuum and the cryogenics and everything that needs to be monitored uh, to keep the beam running smoothly. If there is any kind of a problem, they can see it from here. They can make adjustments from here. <clears throat> also, um, you know, in the uneventful, in the unlikely event that there's a major problem, they can, we'll see that, they can shut the beam down and we'll know where we need to go in and make repairs. So now we're gonna walk back over to Wilson Hall So now we're on the back side of Wilson Hall, and the round building that you see on, on the back of it is the Ramsey Auditorium. That is our main auditorium. It seats 849 people. Um, main purpose is for physics conferences and lectures. But in that auditorium, we also host throughout the year uh, a series of lectures which are open to the public that are scientists that come from all over the world to speak here on topics sometimes physics related, sometimes uh, other topics. Uh, for example, we had a professor of medicine from University of Texas talking about uh, cancer, genetic aspects of cancer. We had a woman from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory a few years ago um, telling us about the Mars rover, which now happens to actually be up on Mars. Um, also in the auditorium throughout the year, we have an arts and lecture series. And we have plays, we have concerts, again from artists all over the world that come here and these are all open to the public. The lecture series actually is taking place online still. Um, the art series hopefully will be able to start again soon.
So now we're in the lobby of the Ramsey Auditorium and the lights are on in there so we can actually take a little peek in there. Acoustically, this place is like perfect. The ceiling of the lobby is all walnut tiles and it was designed by Robert Wilson. Now we're entering the atrium of Wilson Hall from the back. This area normally is our cafeteria. And, and there are two remote operations center that are here off of off the atrium of Wilson Hall. So the one we're looking at now is a remote operations center for what's called the CMS detector on the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. So the large there are actually two detectors on the Large Hadron Collider that Fermilab is very involved with. One is called the Atlas detector and one is called the CMS detector. We were involved with the with the build, with the rebuild of them and also with their everyday monitoring interpretation of the data. So this communication center have, is receiving real-time data from Switzerland from the CMS detector. The other remote operations center is the one we're approaching here, this brightly lit room. Sometimes we call it the Apple Store. And in there is where we monitor all of our neutrino experiments. Um, actually, we're not using this room right now. There are sites all over the world with other scientists that are involved with our experiments where there are stations for monitoring each experiment. And so somewhere in the world at some point, every experiment has somebody monitoring that experiment and then the data coming in. And you can see each sign that you see, like NOVA, DESI, that's a different experiment. And that is the station for monitoring that experiment. So that concludes the tour portion, and now I will be joined by one of our scientists, and we will answer your questions live. If you haven't had a chance to type them into the chat yet, do it right Okay, um, I think that's the end of the video there. Um, I want to, we do have several questions. So um, Alex Perloff, I uh, apologize, I said, postdoc student and you're not a student anymore, you're a postdoc. So um, I have several different questions that came in. The first one actually would be more for uh, Steve, I believe, because um, it has to do with uh, um, just going into a little more depth on what you had said earlier. What kind of industries does technology developed by accelerated research attract or help? Or maybe Alex, you can answer that as well. One I can think of right off the top of my head that we're working on uh, in the IARC building now is um, water purification, using accelerator technology for water purification. Um, um, that's, that's one that comes to mind right away. Medical, uh, there's lots in terms of medical. Um, yeah, so in, in the medical field, you have cancer therapies. Um, you know, we have the ones that Steve spoke about before during the tour, um, but there are new ones. Um, you know, accelerator physicists are really good at steering these beams and conforming the beams to certain specifications, which is, um, 
which is necessary when talking about uh, cancer therapies. And so uh, at both Fermilab and the other laboratory that Steve was talking about at CERN, they're coming up with new technologies for steering the beams, for conforming them to specific energies, specific intensities, uh, and aiming them at specific parts of a person's body. Okay. Uh, the next question is in the latest G minus two experiment, we got a different value for G for the muons. Could it be related to string theory? And what could be some reasons behind that anomaly? Um, so without try, you know, stealing the uh, G minus two researchers thunder, uh, we, we don't really know yet. Um, so what we've done is we've measured this value and we know that it's different than what um, our model of the universe would, would say, would anticipate. Um, it could be due, the most exciting thing would be if it was due to new particles that we hadn't discovered yet. So it's possible that, so this, this value, um, G, gets a contribution from every particle in the universe, every type of particle, I should say. And uh, if there is a type of particle we have not discovered, then it would slightly modify this value of G. Um, and so, you know, if it is, if, if we have pretty good evidence now that um, there is something out there that we did not, we have not added to our model. Um, and if uh, this is true, then we should be expecting new types of particles. Or um, it could be that our model, the thing that guides us in our calculation of this value G is wrong in some other way. So um, stay tuned is the best I can say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question is, um, how efficient is it to cool the magnets to that low a temperature in order to create a superconductor? Wouldn't that get costly? It is, as I understand it, uh, very costly. I'm not an accelerator physicist. I don't run, I don't do the budgets for Fermilab, so I can't give you exact numbers. But um, it, cooling these magnets takes a lot of liquid helium. Um, this is uh, now helium is abundant in, in sort of the universal scale, but it's really hard to get liquid helium. It's um, um, you have to you have to you know pull it out, pull it out of the air, and then you have to condense it and cool it. And um, so I would imagine just guessing that it's pretty expensive. Well, I do know that we do compress the helium again so that we can reuse the helium over and over again, which does reduce the cost. So yeah. um, accelerators are some of the um, biggest users of liquid helium um, wh and whether that's you know our our very powerful magnets for, at Fermilab or at CERN um, uh, and then MRIs one of the reasons they're so expensive is the power and cooling requirements. I, I know that when we were running the Tevatron our monthly bill with Commonwealth Edison was over a million dollars and I'm sure they gave us some kind of volume discount on top of it. So it is, expen it is expensive. So the next question is, if neutrinos are so hard to detect, how do you know that there are 10 to the 15th um, neutrinos going through the beam? You want to answer that or you want me to, Alex? Uh, go for it. <laughs> so, well, you know, we know what's in our proton beam. I mean, we, we can just calculate it and it, it's an estimate, of course, but we know what's in the proton beam. We know what happens. The proton beam is, you know, run into a graphite target, which starts the process to create the neutrino beam. And we know what that process is. So we know how many protons we're starting out with. So we know how many neutrinos we're gonna end up with. Okay. Like I said, it's an estimate, you know. Right. So dark matter and dark energy are still quite unknown. How do you de differentiate between dark matter and dark energy? And how do detectors detect both dark matter and dark energy? So let me start off with saying that uh, the names dark matter and dark energy seem to indicate that we know exactly what these things are. <laughs> um, and that's not really true. So dark, we, we, we can tell by looking at the universe 
how much visible matter there is. That was that 5% of stuff that reflects light and we can see it with our telescopes. We then know from, from other cosmological observations that there is something that has a gravitational pull, but that we can't see. And this is the stuff that we call dark matter. Uh, and we estimate that that's about, as Steve said, 25% of the matter, the stuff that makes up the universe. Then there is something out there that is causing, um, so we know that galaxies are moving apart, but we know that they're moving apart at an accelerated rate. So they start to fly apart, but as you look out further and further, they're going faster and faster away from each other. Um, so there's something out there uh, that is causing this effect, uh, and we, don't, we can't see it. We don't know what it is, and so we call it dark energy. Um, so they have, di they have different effects on the cosmos. Now, when we talk about how do, how do we look for these things, well, we have the dark, uh, um, the dark energy survey uh, and the dark energy camera, DCAM. And those are looking out in the universe for evidence of dark energy, what might it be? And then uh, closer to home, we have, um, you know, we have our, our detectors along these accelerator beam lines uh, that look for uh, dark matter. Now, if, if dark matter is what we think it is, it's probably a particle, you know, um, or it could be a particle, I should say. Uh, we don't know exactly what, uh, what its properties and behavior would be. So we don't know what mass it will be. We don't know what, exactly what we're looking for. So we have tons and tons of analyzers looking at it, it, you know, different type, different signatures, different ways of looking for dark matter. And uh, in fact, that's one of the things I do. I look for evidence of dark matter in our particle collisions inside of our detectors. Um, and so we wouldn't necessarily expect to see evidence of dark energy in our detectors because these are on very small scales, uh, but you would expect that looking through a camera uh, on a telescope which we have been doing as well, yes. Okay, future experiments will envision the emergence of new physics with predictions already announced, namely supersymmetry, supergravity, and there's question mark, what, what else? I think that's what they're getting at is, what else do you foresee in future experiments? Oh, uh, <laughs> so you're asking me a bit to, um, <laughs> to predict the future. Uh, <laughs> I would say, so when designing a physics experiment, well, first of all, these, the designs for these experiments take place decades before they're realized. Um, you know, the, the, it took a really long time to build the, um, uh, to, to build the Tevatron. It took a real, after it was conceived and then designed and then constructed and then to operate it. Uh, it the same thing took place at the Large Hadron Collider. It was, uh, conceived and designed decades before it was <clears throat> operation. So, um, and generally what happens is it's a progression. We, um, we started measuring the lightest of particles and eventually we went and, and discovered, measured the heaviest of the particles. Now, the most recent particle that we discovered was the Higgs boson. And already we're starting to talk about new experiments that will measure the properties of the Higgs boson uh, at, um, very precisely. Uh, these are your so-called Higgs factories. Um, but in, in, we also talk about the progression of, of how particles were discovered, uh, progressively more and more massive particles. And so the next experiments are going to be much larger, much more powerful. Um, for discovering these, uh, what we hope are new particles that are at higher mass scales. There are also the, so this is sort of the energy frontier. Now we also have neutrino experiments uh, like those that are being run at Fermilab um, and are currently being constructed. So the, I'm speaking specifically of the Dune experiment, which will um, look for, uh, you know, uh, measure specific quantities of our model and look uh, and help us to solve um, certain aspects of our current model that we don't understand. 
Um, so there, there is a progression. Now, whether, whether or not we're going to discover supersymmetry or supergravity, I can't answer that. Um, you know, that's, I cannot predict what will be the, the next great discovery, but hopefully um, one of the current or future accelerators that we are planning will be, will offer us that next great discovery. Can I, Thank you. I want you. to say something about Dune too, and some ideas that we have or things that we hope come out of Dune. You know, I mentioned that part of it is just to further study the neutrino oscillation, but one of the one of the things we hope to answer from Dune is this, is that why do we live in a matter dominated world? That at the time of the Big Bang, you know, we think that what should happen is there'd be 50% matter and 50% antimatter produced, and they would just kind of stay in this cycle of, you know, forming and annihilating each other and, and nothing, no world, no universe ever would have really developed. So why is there a, a matter dominated world and there's some evidence that neutrinos could hold the key to that answer um, because neutrinos and this is kind of mind-blowing and if you want explanation of this ask Alex but neutrinos could possibly be their own antiparticle and um, you know part of what we're going to be doing with Dune is for a couple years sending a beam of neutrinos into the detector and for a couple of years sending a beam of anti-neutrinos into the de detector and comparing the data and seeing you know if they do indeed behave differently which we suspect another just quick interesting thing that'll come out of dune that's just on the side but it's a nice thing is that whenever there's a supernova it produces massive amounts of neutrinos and Dune and Nova is also, but Dune will be better suited to do this. Dune is poised to, should there be a supernova during the time that we're running it, we will see that and be able to learn hopefully a lot about what happened in that supernova. Um, so that's some wanna, things that actually going on here related to Fermi Lab. Um, I wanna focus on that point that Steve just said is, um, that if there's a supernova that Dune could, could measure the neutrinos coming out of that, that's a really important change in science uh, that's taken place in, uh, you know, in the last few years is this idea of multi-messenger science, that we can detect the same event um, in, the, you know, in the cosmos uh, using multiple detectors on Earth, um, whether that's you know, uh, optical telescopes and gravitational waves, or in this case, it'll be some sort of telescope plus, you know, a, um, a particle detector. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, I also want to say that Alex has agreed to extend the time a little bit. So I understand if uh, some of you need to drop off, but he has kindly um, agreed to uh, answer a few further questions. Um, regarding Dune, we do have another question. Any update on Dune experiment construction? I think we're saying we're hoping to start collect data, collecting data in probably about 2029 ish, but that could change. Yeah, I know they're still doing some ex excavation there to. Uh, they're still removing, they have not started right. building they're, the detector yet, they're still removing rock. Right. So they had to widen right. the, create the, the space underground space. chambers to fit in these detectors. These are, mm -hmm. excuse me, massive, massive containers uh, of liquid argon. So they, um, it'll take a long time to excavate. Then you have to build the containers, the cryostats, and then you have to fill them, which I'm told will take a long time as well. And, and it's about a mile underground. So all the rock that they're excavating out has to be brought to the surface. I mean, it's not just move it out of the way, off to the side. There's no side to move it to. Yeah, they had to construct a long conveyor so they pull the rock up and then send it mm -hmm. off to a, you know, to a spot where they can dump the rock. All right. Can you please tell us a little bit about how to use plasma for future accelerators? Um, this person says, I read about it somewhere, but do not know a lot about it. I'll say my understanding is is 
pretty rudimentary, but um, I'll do my best. Um, the idea is that you have, so for those of you who don't know what a plasma is, it's um, uh, basically if you, um, it's like a soup of protons uh, and electrons and they're not held in, in, in sort of a stru structure like atoms, it's just a soup. And it's really hot. Um, and what they do is, that, I mean, they're studying multiple different technologies. One of them is you create this uh, bubble um, that will then contain a bunch of whatever particle you're trying to accelerate. And this bubble is gonna move along and carry uh, this bunch along with it. The idea is, uh, so, so Steve talked about these radio frequency cavities that accelerate particles um, and they're sort of surfing along radio waves. That's one way to accelerate particles. And we've achieved, uh, we've had really good success at creating these superconducting radio frequency cavities um, and uh, accelerating these particles to really um, high energies. The promise of these plasma accelerators is that they could um, do the same acceleration, but in a much shorter distance, rather than taking, um, you know, uh, you know, 500 feet or many, many miles to accelerate um, these, uh, these particles to the energies we want, they could do that in a much, much shorter distance, um, you know, talking about tens or hundreds of meters as opposed to miles. Okay, um, I think we need to start wrapping this up. Um, I will say you can always go to the Fermilab website to get more information. I see a couple of questions regarding Saturday morning physics and regarding um, careers. Um, and you can always go to our website to get that information. It's fnal.gov. Uh, I also wanted to tell you uh, that um, we will have uh, the participants will receive a link to the recording once it is uploaded to YouTube. We had someone asking if, if that recording was going to be available. Um, and uh, so we will be sending that out to you. I want to thank uh, several people who've been working behind the scenes, like Laura Paterno, who's been helping with some of the technology. I want to thank Alex. I want to thank Maureen and Steve and Amanda for all their help on this uh, production. So thank you very much.